Hello, and welcome to worship with Cheney United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Alyssa Birch, and on behalf of our associate pastor, Pat Sleeth, it's my joy to welcome you to this time of worship. Here at Cheney UMC, we are in the midst of a sermon series on the book of 1 John called The Heart of the Matter. And today, Pastor Pat will be serving as our resident cardiologist and will invite us to take some time to think about our cardiac signature and what it means to love each other as siblings in Christ. The service will also feature communion and the offering, and there will be instructions further along in the service to help you along. But as always, if you would like the expanded bulletin to go along with the service, you can find it on our website at www.cheneyumc.org. There you'll find the hymn sheets with the music, as well as Pastor Pat's full manuscript, as well as any other instructions you might need to get through the service. But please know we've designed it to help carry you along right here virtually. It's our tradition as well to start our service with a time setting aside the busyness of our lives outside of worship. So as Cedric plays the prelude this morning, you're invited to center your hearts and minds using this question. What is the hardest thing that God had to do? by Diane Foote, who is serving as our liturgist, and she will be leading us in the call to worship. Your part will be in bold, and you will be joining me. Let's get started, Diane. Thank you. Day by day, God leads us. To the deep, deep pools of peace, to the green, lush lawns of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us. To pour out ourselves in service, to anoint the stranger with hope. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us. The community we could be, the family we are called to become. I invite you to join us now in the opening hymn. Sharing love with all, bring your scattered people. 
morning star Bring your scattered people Thank you, John. I invite you now to join me in a time of opening prayer. Loving and gracious God, we ask that you join us this day as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship and especially for love. Teach us your ways. Guide our too often faltering steps. Live in us, we pray, that we may be people of steadfast hope and powerful, loving, and sharing. Help us to really hear your words and challenge us to give back to you all the things that are, in fact, already yours. Help us to remember that all we are and all we have are gifts from you, gifts to be shared in service and caring. Holy One who is among us today and always, help us to be a holy people who receive your word today with joy and strive to live out your message with love and hope. Amen. The epistle reading this week is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're, real, we're living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut out debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do about ourselves. And friends, once that's taken care of and we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves, we're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we, add, what we asked for because we're doing what he said, doing what pleases him. Again, this is God's command to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. He told us to love each other in line with the original command. As we keep his commands, we live deeply and surely in him, and he lives in us. And this is how we experienced his deep and abiding presence in us, by the spirit he gave us, the word of life. Thanks be to God. Now, friends, as a rule, I'm not really much of a fan of television. But sometimes late at night when my insomnia comes calling and I don't feel like reading, I'll see if I can find a police show, especially the forensic science-focused shows. I love mentally cataloging the clues and seeing if I can figure it out before they actually uh, break, uh, break the identity on the show. And frankly, I have to admit that I don't do it all the time. Now, if you happen to enjoy this kind of entertainment as well, you know that there are certain types of physical characteristics that are totally unique to each of us. For instance, somewhere in the script of all crime dramas, they almost always explain that your fingerprints are unique. No one else on the entire planet Earth has the fingertip uh, and fingerprint print swirls exactly like yours. And did you know that the pattern of your irises, that is the, the colored parts of your eyes, uh, 
is also totally unique to you. And of course, so is your DNA. But did you also know that the same is true with your heartbeat? I didn't. Now, according to some uh, online research, I found that each of us has a cardiac signature that is also completely unique to us, and it can't be altered. In fact, the Pentagon has built a laser-based instrument that, once provided with this cardiac signature, can identify people by their heartbeat from three football fields away. And apparently, uh, scientists are expanding upon the positive uses for this technology, including the military use, police use, flights, and even the space program. Now, personally, I I'd never imagined that I could be identified and tracked by my physical heartbeat. I wonder what else my heart could tell others. Do you suppose there is some infallible way that we could pick a Christian out of a crowd using this technology? Kind of a cardiac signature to our faith. Well, we'll get into that a bit more in just a moment. But first, let's pause to be in prayer together. Holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Now, in 1 John chapter 3, it's pretty clear that we don't need a laser to tell us what a Christian's uh, cardiac signature looks like. According to our text for today, the only test for who is and who isn't a Christian is by our love for others. That is, our loving actions. Actions that are based upon effort and not talk. Verse 18 of our text for today reads, Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. The writer of this text is saying that talk's cheap, but real love, the kind of love God showed us through Jesus' example, the kind of love that can change the entire world is neither cheap nor easy. So let's be clear. This text was written to define the Christian concept of love and to encourage people of faith to be more loving towards one another and to those in need. The writer tells us that if we can't do that, we've missed the changed heart, which is the cardiac signature of faith that Christ freely offers to each of us. Now, recently... I found an interesting, if somewhat random, snippet in a sermon by Pastor Robert Allen on this particular text. It was part of a conversation with Al Lindgren, who's a professor at Garrett Theological Seminary. It's a conversation he had with his son. Now, apparently, Dr. Lindgren's son asked his father, what's the toughest thing God ever tried to do? Now, brothers and sisters, they teach you a lot of things in preacher school. But this question is one they missed, or I was dozing. Dr. Lindgren uh, turns out to be a, a clever man. He racked his brain for an answer, and then, wisely, he asked his son, well, what do you think God's greatest challenge was? Now, it turns out that his son was up to the challenge. He said, I thought the creation of the world might be the hardest thing that God ever tried to do. But then in Sunday school, we talked about miracles. So I thought the resurrection might be the toughest thing God ever tried to do. But after thinking it over, I decided that the toughest thing God ever had to do was to get us to understand how much he loves us and that he wants us to love others. Now, frankly, I think this young man was on to something. Maybe the toughest task God had to do is to get people to understand who he really is and that he loves us. Now, I say that because he's still trying to help us figure out that he's really not a white-bearded grandfather sitting in a rocking chair and handing out winning lottery tickets. He's the master engineer who has a plan for humanity, and the first principle in that plan is to love each other. 
Now, Scripture points out who God is through the examples provided to us through Scripture and the earliest traditions of the faith of Israel and of the fledgling Christian church. Then he came to us in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. And how did God get us to understand that he really loves us? Well, personally, I think that's an easy one to answer. He demonstrated his great love by his actions. God provided the one sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice any parent would ever have to make, one that stamped paid in full on our passport to eternal life. Friends, he offered his son to pay the price that we could never pay. Now, the writer understood that if he didn't make it perfectly clear what Christian love looks like, we would try to define it for ourselves, which, of course, we've tried to do. And if you don't think so, go ahead and ask 10 people for a definition of love. And I'll bet you get more than two dozen different definitions. So the writer of today's text doesn't intend to let us make it up for ourselves. In verse 16, he gives us the working definition of Christian love. Paraphrased, he says this. This is what real love looks like. Jesus put others before himself, and we should follow that example. Now that's a clear, unambiguous, to the point definition for those who would claim to follow Jesus. The traditions of the church and our scriptures tell us that the essence of the Christian church is love, and it must be. Scripture says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Little children, let us love, not in words or speech, but in truth and action. But the truth for most of us is that it isn't always easy to love, is it? In fact, we often tend to withhold love until someone passes our personal test for being worthy of love. Too often we love those we think are deserving of our love, which is the opposite of Jesus' example. He didn't love us because we were easy to love or that we somehow deserve it. He loves us using the model of God's love, a love that goes so far beyond mercy that it becomes grace. And he intends for us to use that same model. Today's text tells us that since Christ laid down his life for us, we should lay down our own lives for others. Now, now that doesn't necessarily mean throwing ourselves in front of a bus to push someone else to safety. What it literally means is changing our focus from ourselves and find a way to love and respect all people even those not at all like us, those we don't agree with, and even those that would do us harm. What it means is doing good to all people, and that means leaving our comfort zone for acts of extraordinary concern. Why should we do that? Well, because the foundation of God's plan for us is built upon love. So because this is true and it's what we teach, surely we realize that love is what the world expects from us, right? So how will the world know we're Christians? By our love. And if the day should ever come when the people of God find a way to be as loving as Jesus' example, the world will come to us and every worship service will be outdoors because no building in the world could hold us. Today's text asks us each to answer this question for ourselves. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the wealth of the world and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Well, friends, I hope you got this one right. It's important that we get it right because the answer is if we're using God's model of love, then of course it doesn't exist if we won't share what we have. I have an example of someone who responded with God's love when they had the chance to do so. 
And no doubt you have any number of examples just like it. Now, I confess to you that I am probably the least gifted member of our worship planning team, at least when it comes to the art and science of hymnody. But though I have no gifts for music, still I adore it. Frankly, sometimes I am so awestruck by the truth and beauty of a piece of music that I have to go back to the hymnal and reread the lyrics to be sure I really get what it means. Like our hymn of response we'll be singing shortly, written by Frances Ridley Havergal. She was an English poet, pianist, and hymn writer in the mid-1800s. And her most famous hymn is probably Take My Life and Let It Be which begins with the words, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And in each verse, she offers some part of her life for the Lord's service. Take my voice, take my hands, take my feet, take my love. She asks God to use every part of her life to make a difference for others. Now, the fourth verse of the hymn begins... Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Now maybe you and I sing it, but sisters and brothers, let me ask you, do we do it? Frances Havergal did it. I say that because she actually did just that. In a journal entry, she wrote of packing a jeweled cabinet, a family heirloom, along with other pieces worth a great deal of money, and sending them off to the Church Missionary Society to be used to fund missionaries in other countries. She noted in her journal that day, I don't think I need to tell you that I have never packed a box with such pleasure. So how do we know that Frances Havergal had a heart like Jesus? By her cardiac signature? Well, we know because she willingly, joyfully, and without reservation gave away her finest treasures. Not just her leftovers. For the sake of sharing the message of Jesus Christ uh, and his love by example with strangers in other parts of the world. And when she heard of their need, she found a way to help. Now that's a heart that beats like Jesus' heart. The fact is, friends, love is far more than just a chemical reaction or an emotion. But what is it? Well, when defined by Jesus and not Hollywood, love really isn't all that complicated. It means doing something about the challenges that face a large part of the world right now. It doesn't mean speeches or marches or angry debates. Love means doing what we can to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick, and and imprisoned. Love really is the primary way the church shares Christ with the world. Love is the gold standard for people of faith and a valuable witness to the rest of the world. As the saying goes, people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Now, there's one more thing that we need to understand about love. It's free. It's not easy, but it's free. One of my favorite bumper stickers reads, Perform an unnatural act today. Really love someone. Real love isn't usually a comfortable process in the human nature. But it is a primary uh, character, nature in God. Our primary nature is to compete, to compete for our fair share and sometimes for our very survival. But God's nature is self-giving love. And that's a hard act to follow, isn't it? But the closer we are to God, the better able we are to love others. The writer of our text for today says, And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given to us. Friends, that spirit is a spirit of love. Love is a gift God gives to us. It's best illustrated by the example of Jesus Christ, and it multiplies like ripples on a pond when we offer it to others. I'd like to wrap up today 
with an anonymous epitaph that I found online in a list of epitaphs of note. Apparently, in an old cemetery in England, there's a neglected tombstone for a man whose name is not given on the list that I found. So I guess he's not famous. But those who knew him must have considered him a meaningful force for good because they laid him to rest under this simple but powerful epitaph. In the worst of times, he did the best of things. Friends, now, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Because in the worst of times, he did the best of things. In the face of religious and social persecution and monumental injustice and, of course, pain and public humiliation, Jesus faced his death with courage and grace. He even forgave those responsible for putting him on the cross. And he willingly suffered his awful fate to show us how far God would go to prove his love for us. Friends, there are many ways of identifying human beings. Everything from names to social security numbers to fingerprints to cardiac signatures that can identify us as individual persons. 2,000 years ago, The writer of our text for today tells us that there is only one thing that identifies a Christian, and that is love. And it's always been needed, but never more than right now. Love is the essence of Christian faith. It also happens to be our primary witness to the world. Love is the greatest gift from the God that is love. We love others because God gave us a pretty clear example of what it looks like and how to do it. He first loved us, and his amazing grace and abiding love have changed our lives forever. Or not. See, we get to choose to accept and share love, or define it in a way that lets us off the hook. See, it's always been up to us to make that choice, hasn't it? May your every day be filled with the love of God and in finding ways to share that love with all that you meet. Amen, and God bless. Friends, I now invite you into a time of giving back to God. 
As Christians, we recognize that God's love is a gift freely given, and that the greatest way to show our acceptance of that love is to share it with others. One of the ways we do that in church is through the offering of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, service, and witness, knowing that every gift is used to share God's love with the world. I invite you to take a moment during the offertory today to consider what you have to give back to God this week. And if you would like to offer a tithe, you're invited to mail it to our church using the address on the screen or to drop by and place it in our mailbox. As you listen to the offertory today, I hope you feel God's love being sent to you and you are inspired to offer that love back to others. join me in the prayer of dedication. The words are on the screen. God of love and sharing, today we give you praise and glory and the thanks for all you have done for us. With post-Easter's new life humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to hear your message of love and wholeness. We present our gifts to you for sharing wherever the needs are greatest and to use this offering as a witness to the whole world that we care. Amen. It is our tradition to celebrate communion on the first Sunday of the month, and as was mentioned at the beginning of the service, if you'd like to participate with us today, you'll need to grab a few things, a plate and a cup, as well as bread or something approximating bread and juice or something approximating juice. Perhaps you have some crackers or gluten-free bread and perhaps some wine or some water. Once you have that set up, we invite you to light a candle representing the light of Christ joining us at the table. 
As we go through the liturgy today, there'll be a few moments where you see our lift our hands, where you're invited to respond. Those words will be on the screen in bold. And we invite you to mimic those movements and to join in those words. Let's begin. Let's do it. Our God is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to our God. Let us give thanks to our sovereign God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, in the beginning was darkness, mystery, and you. By your own word, you shattered the darkness with light. You set in the sky radiant beams of sunlight and punctured the night sky with sparkling jewels. You forever changed our darkness. Holy God, though there are shadows and worries, you have placed your word in us to be a lamp for our feet. You have given your spirit like a bright guiding star. You fill us with your love as glorious as the sun. You place your truth like a crescent moon. Every darkness is overcome with light. And every light contains shafts of your eternal light. God of the sun and stars, we praise you. And with all the creatures of earth and all the company of heaven, we join the unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Ever persistent and always loving God, you placed a star in the sky to guide people from afar and near to your son. Jesus became the light of the world, drawing the lost and forgotten, the hurt and the wounded, the oppressed and the depressed, to the wellsprings of life. He changed water into wine, called unheralded workers to be disciples, preached good news to the poor, healed the sick and beckoned people to love their neighbor. By his baptism, suffering, death, and resurrection, he revealed the depth of your love and power of light over darkness. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus gathered with his friends. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my life poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, holy God, grant that in praise and thanksgiving we may be a living sacrifice, holy and accept, acceptable in your sight, and that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that through Christ's presence we may become a beacon of holy light, a source of joy, a witness for peace. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one with seekers far and near, and one in ministry to all the world until we feast at Christ's heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, healing God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We now invite you during the communion song to receive. If you are worshiping with others, we invite you to take turns serving one another. The peace of Christ be with you.
I invite you to join with me in the prayer after communion. The words will be on the screen. Lord, you now have set your servants free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of ours have seen the Savior whom you have prepared for all the world to see. Blessing and honor and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure worshiping with each of you. Please receive the benediction. As people of faith, we have gathered this day to worship. And as people of faith, we are now sent back into the world. So let us go out to share the story of faith, the story of life, and especially the story of love with the world around us. Let us be intentional to share the faith in word and deed in both speech and action. And as we go out, may we offer a living witness, testifying to the truth of God's love and being active in the world. Let us go knowing that God goes with us, sharing the laughter and the hope, the fears and the tears, and especially the love. Thanks be to God. Amen.